The Spotlight, shining a light on podcasts and videos that have caught our attention. Hi, and welcome to The Spotlight. I'm Jen Spiker, and today I'm highlighting a podcast you'll find on the Vision app of a conversation from Vision's National Talkback Program 2020. Each weekday, Neil Johnson and Andrew McLennan look at life, culture, and current events through a biblical lens. A recent guest on 2020 was the founder of a podcast called Resilient Souls. Stuart Bogle joined Andrew McLennan to share about the podcast and some of his personal story. The Spotlight with Jen Spiker. There's an exciting new podcast in Australia called Resilient Souls, and it's capturing the lives and the stories of people that have faced real hardship in their lives. And the founder of Resilient Souls, Stuart Bogle, has a story of his own, and he joins us now. Stuart, welcome. Thanks so much, Andrew. Stuart, podcasting has obviously just become a worldwide phenomenon and many people download their information, their news, their entertainment. You know, there's so much, and and I guess in the case of Christian, spiritual nourishment from podcasting. And so why did you start your podcast, Resilient Souls? Well, it really goes back to a sense that uh, God had put a story in my heart that he wanted me to get out there. And so for a long time, I'd been through many traumas and many difficult experiences and so I felt a desire to write a book I called Learning to Dance in the Darkness but every time I tried to sit down and write it something new would come along and it would distract me and I'd have to deal with that and so years and years later I finally finished it Um, and that was just in the middle of COVID and I was about to publish that and then I had this real sense that well, I really want to help people, but this is just my story. It's my perspective from my personality, my theology. So I began to get curious about how other people have, have gone through storms in life. So I, my book's called Learning to Dance in the Darkness because that's what I've been doing is learning how to dance in the dark times, how to rejoice in the Lord always. And so I decided to ask other people, how have they done that? And so a curiosity led to me starting this podcast and it's been life-giving, Andrew, just hearing Others, it's confirmed some things that I already knew that would help people or not help people through the storm, but it also has taught me a whole lot about incredible people, or should I say ordinary people who have got an incredible story. Yeah, I love the title of your book, Learning to Dance in the Darkness, and it sounds like, and look, i got to be honest, I have read your story, so I know your story, so I'm not going to pretend I don't, but obviously you wrote that book because you faced some really significant challenges in your life, you have faced and stared down the darkness. Do you want to just give us, you know, a brief version of that, Stuart? Sure. So life was going really well in many ways. I was running a Bible school in a beautiful part of New South Wales, had young adults from all over the world coming, and it's where I got saved as an 18-year-old. So to go back there and serve on the team there was just incredible. So I was dreaming of the future, and um, one day, long story short, my wife walked through the door and I saw a look on her face that told me that uh, she had cancer. She'd been to check out a lump that we'd been worried about for a year and the doctor kept saying, don't worry about it, You just it's a lump from breastfeeding, it's fine. But this time she went and the doctor said, no, it's it's really serious. So at that time, I'm running a Bible college, I'm preaching and speaking all over the place and um, I was really wrestling with how could this happen? And we were hoping for the miracle. And this battle went on for a few years. We had to give up the role there. We had to return back to Adelaide. The um, medical, the hospitals were too far away in in, um, New South Wales and we were traveling too much and needed to be around family. So we went on a three and a half year battle. And um, unfortunately she went to be with the Lord and I was left with three young children. And so single dad, three young children. I wasn't able to work and I was lining up at Centrelink and my world had completely changed. And you know, I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought, well, I'll be faithful. I've been faithful to God, cared for my wife. I'm there for my children and um, God will reward me. And from that point on, I'm not even sure where I got that idea from, but from that point on, I went through a series of incredible challenges. It was a, a few years later, I, I remarried thinking that was going to be the answer to all of my uh, pain and, and suffering. And that was an incredibly difficult journey too. I won't go into detail there because I don't think that's my story to share other than it was really hard. And where I was seen, I think, as a fairly noble guy, the way I cared for my wife, in this instance, I I think uh, people made some judgments about me and um, that led to my reputation being damaged and I was no longer being invited to speak anywhere or to share anywhere. And 
people didn't know what had gone on, but um, that was incredibly hard. And again, I caught my breath and thought, you know, things all improve from now. I've been faithful again, loved as best I could. Um, and then I just went through a series of what I, you know, in some ways I, I laughed because it could be called a series of unfortunate events. We had um, my son, who's just a standout young man, just loves Jesus, just incredible young guy, was trying to romance his now wife, but uh, it was just a Valentine's Day um, thing he did on the hills overlooking Adelaide. And a little bit of oil from the pan splashed into a flame and he lit up the entire hills over Adelaide. And at that time, they had a pastor law saying, if you start a fire, you're going to jail. So we faced 12 months in and out of court. People seeing us on the, the news and thinking, here we go, an arsonist here and look at this story. So I was just, you know, just completely broken going, how are we going to um, deal with this now? Fortunately, he was exonerated. And they passed, um, or they, they allowed the white paper, the incident, and he was allowed to be let go because they all realized that it was just an error. And so during this time, I was diagnosed with cancer myself and um, had the battle with cancer and didn't really know how to, to, to deal with that because um, I'd know, I knew what my wife had gone through. So I had surgery and, and they thought that was all going to clear everything up. And uh, three months later, they said they didn't get it and it had spread. So now I'm battling with uh, what they say is potentially life-threatening now, and they had to do some pretty serious um, therapy to try to deal with that. So I'm trying to um, deal with that, deal with the loss of the marriage, deal with the reputational damage, deal with so many things going on, thinking there's going to be some relief at some point, Andrew. But can and we then, just um, stop this? So let me just ask, how old were you when your first wife passed away? I was 39. And and how old was she? Around the same age, or a bit younger she than you? She was the same age, thirty nine. So she'd had she'd battled the cancer for three and a half years. Man, and she's obviously been a faithful Christian her whole life. Oh, she was amazing. She was just in the most incredible person, and um, just had an, a remarkable way of facing the storm. She didn't uh, go into a panic. She didn't try to do bargains with God. She just um, trusted Him. She prayed. She worked through the pain and the loss, but she kept doing what she'd always done. She read the Bible. She listened to great messages and great music. She was kind and giving. And so it was, um, I've, I'm not sure I could, could say that anybody could handle a, a storm like she faced better. Yeah. And then, so I'm guessing, like you said, you're a young, youngish dad with three small kids. And you probably always thought, if I can get remarried, I can bring some stability back to my life, my kid's life. There'll be a family unit again. And looking back, Stuart, do you think, you maybe weren't ready to remarry and you just maybe jumped in too quick or you just weren't in a place to, to make a really good choice. Like, Do you, do you have much of reflection on that? <laughs> yeah, I've had lots of time to reflect on that. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that question or many of the questions you might ask. Um, it had been four and, a, four and a bit years. I hadn't even been out on a date with another woman. I was pretty content on my own doing my thing. So it wasn't like I rushed like I think a lot of people do because they're lonely. I'd pretty well come to terms with the fact I was on my own. So I did have my legs taken out from under me and fell in love uh, really quickly. But I probably wasn't wise, didn't really read all the signs or even realize how complex the environment I was asking this um, beautiful young woman to come into so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things I can reflect back, but, you know, I don't think it serves well to spend too much time on, you know, why did that happen? What could I have done differently? It, it happened. Yeah, yeah. I'm only asking because of, of our listeners, you know, that, that who may be in a similar situation to you, uh, if there's anything yeah. that you can take away from that, they can take away from that. So, obviously, yeah, that marriage ended after a couple of years and, man, and then your son. So, you really have faced some darkness in your life, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, still a couple of chapters to go too, but uh, it has been not at all what I'd expected. I actually opened up my book with a line saying, this isn't the life I expected to live, but it's a life I've been given. So, you know, I had to really, uh, the subtitle of the book is Wrestling with God in the Darkest of Times, because it was a wrestle. It was trying to work out why was this relentless suffering um, happening? Um, you know, it was only a year ago, Andrew, that my daughter, who went through all of this with me, beautiful young woman, married a childhood sweetheart and he died three months after they had their public wedding they they got married during covid where only five of us could go and a year later they had their public wedding and he you know so i'm speaking at their wedding and then three months later later i'm speaking at the funeral because he died of cancer as well so yeah. there's been this relentless series of challenges that has you know really really impacted us and, and i wanted to do something with my book 
Um, but to be honest, Andrew, I think the book started off when I first wrote it 10 years ago as a triumphal series of messages around how you, you know, get through the storm and, and pretty tango in the darkness. But since I've been through so many other things subsequently, I think it's humbled me a lot and made me realize that what people need is not some polished message of everything's going to work out if you get enough people praying or if you do this or you do that. It's a real and honest story of how do you keep your eyes on God through the storm and more so what do you, how do you keep your eyes on God through multiple storms because they just kept coming. Yeah, man. Wow. I mean, that's really, really intense what you've been through. Stuart, can I ask, in the Bible, who do you identify most? Like, we all identify with characters in the Bible. I think as a new Christian, we like to identify with the apostles, you know, preaching and healing the sick and being, you know, used by God. But now that you're a little bit older and, and wiser and you've been through some of, the, of these challenges, who do you really identify with in the Scriptures? Yeah, I'd probably say two characters. One, one is Paul, because the the message of Paul in Philippians 4, uh, chapters uh, verses 4 to 6 it speaks to me about how do you how do you face the darkness and continue to trust God? And how do you rejoice in the Lord always without that being happiness and smiles and pretending? Here's a guy in jail. Here's a guy that didn't get what he was hoping for in so many ways, but he was using his life to still say, you know, trust, trust Jesus no matter what. And the other character is Joseph. I just love the story of Joseph. I used to do a lot of teaching through Joseph how if you look at how his story, he looks back and sees the hand of God woven through everything. And so he doesn't blame God. He doesn't try to work it all out. He just faithfully goes and he forgives in the end people that have wronged him. He explains to them that they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So I love both of those characters. Yeah, awesome, mate. And obviously uh, in your Dancing in the Dark, the scriptures were a big part of you just keeping strong and, and staying solid. Yeah, they were. I, I look at be honest and and say that I find that often you go to the scriptures for comfort and you don't always find it. Sometimes it's like reading something in a foreign language, but there are little glimpses I got. So I'd go to the Psalms and I'd I'd find there's permission to feel down and struggle. You'd see the some of the stuff around lament me as well that I wasn't alone. But it was that passage I think in Philippians four, which says rejoice in the Lord always, and then goes into a very practical couple of verses about how God gives a peace that guards our hearts and our minds, that really spoke to me. So yeah, I, I kept going to the Word and I kept going to God, but it wasn't always easy. And while it sounds easy, you open the Bible and you get comfort, it wasn't like that. It was a wrestle. Yeah, wow. Well, you're obviously really well qualified to, uh, to have a podcast called Resilient Souls. And you've written a book called Dancing in the Darkness. Is that the name of it again? Dancing in the Darkness? No, it's actually Learning to Dance in the Darkness. A couple of people have said, look, I think you should shorten it to Dancing in the Darkness. And I said, that has a that has a sense of completion to it that I've worked it out. But I'm still learning to dance in the darkness. And I've got to remind myself often that this is a journey, not a destination. On the Spotlight, we've been listening to a conversation that Andrew McLennan had with Stuart Vogel recently on 2020. You can find out more about Stuart and link to his podcast, book and blog at resilientsouls.com.au. Every weekday, there are several interviews on 2020 covering a range of topics. If you ever miss a conversation, you can listen on demand in the Vision app. Catch up on what you've missed by tapping the podcast tab and search for 2020. Plus, you can watch a selection of interviews in the watch tab of the app. My name is Jen Spiker. Join me next time on The Spotlight as I share another podcast or video that deserves highlighting. For more great podcasts and videos like the one featured today, check out vision.org.au or the free Vision app.